Leaving Falkirk Here you're in one of the industrial heartlands of Scotland. The massive petrochemical works of Grangemouth lies nearby, on the upper reaches of the Forth, but there are older industries here too. Canals were built in the 1700s, linking the rivers Forth and Clyde, in order to transport coal and other heavy goods. Look inland after you leave the station and you'll spot what's called the Falkirk Wheel. Now this modern-day link between the two old canals was built not for industry, but for recreation. It's an unusual shape, but it's not really a wheel at all, and it's an engineering masterpiece. What you're looking at there is the only rotating boat lift in the world. This marvel of engineering was designed and constructed as a Millennium Project, and it opened in 2002. It provided the last link in reopening two canals which had been abandoned for decades. Boats can now pass from Edinburgh, along the Union Canal, all the way to Glasgow via the Forth and Clyde Canal. The Falkirk Wheel has become a very popular visitor attraction. It takes about 15 minutes to be transported from one canal level to another. And it's incredible to think that this immense piece of engineering uses just one and a half kilowatts to power the movement. That's less than it takes to boil ten kettles of water. Obviously, it's not just boats which use the canals. These waterways are rich with wildlife. They're a haven for birds, fish and insects. If you watch carefully, you might just spot a grey heron standing completely still amongst the canal-side vegetation. The heron is very well equipped for fishing here, with its long legs giving it a good view over the water and its sharp yellow bill, which is ideal for speeding fish. Or there's the brilliant blue and orange kingfisher, much smaller than the heron, which darts out from the riverside to catch fish. At dusk, bats will take to the air in search of moths and insects. They're incredibly agile animals. And even the smallest bat needs around 3,000 insects a night just to keep them going. Your train is carrying you towards Stirling. Merchants, travellers and even invading armies have been coming this way for centuries to find a safe crossing point over the Firth of Forth. As a result, various battles have been fought around here. Keep watching and when you start to glimpse the suburbs of Stirling, you'll reach the site of the most famous of these battles, the Battle of Bannockburn. In 1314, the Scots troops of Robert the Bruce and the troops of Edward II clashed across this broad expanse of land. Around 6,000 infantry and 500 cavalry were following the Bruce, but Edward's army was immense. 14 or 15,000 infantry, 3,000 heavy cavalry and as many as 20,000 archers. On the first day, when two armies, each with 4,000 men, attacked each other, there was no clear victor, and both forces withdrew. On the next day, the Scots advanced in Edward's full army. His forces seemed to have been so surprised by this move that the archers had no time to prepare. The cavalry were driven back, and their support troops were quite literally bogged down. Confusion erupted, and the army broke and fled. Edward II escaped to Edinburgh and was eventually taken south by boat, but many of his men weren't so lucky. Some fled to Stirling Castle, then held by supporters of Edward, but weren't given entry. They were subsequently taken prisoner. But many others were caught in the boggy terrain and were slaughtered on Bannockburn battlefield. However, although the battle was won by the Bruce, the war wasn't yet over. He'd claimed control of the Scottish Kingdom in 1306 and was now victorious, but wouldn't be confirmed by treaty as King of Scotland until 1328, 